evening, good evening, everyone. Give me just a couple, couple minutes here. Invite a few people, and then we will get started on tonight. That's everyone. All right, all right, all right. Let's see who all just jumped on real quick. Dusty, what's going on, man? Love and miss you too. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to connect soon. Uh, miss Keisha, good to see you on. Reagan, uh, long time no see from you. Um, glad that you were able to join tonight. And P Dub, what is up, Philip Boyd? <clears throat> Y'all, I'm really excited. Um, just thinking back over. Um, this past week and even where we're going to be at today, um, I always encourage when I get on, um, if you did not get a chance to go back and catch the live feeds from last week, go back and do it. Y'all, there's so much truth that is being unpacked and it's not, and it's not coming from a specific angle. And what I mean by that is it's not coming from a, a, a specific type of background, a specific type of denomination a specific type of opinion. It's literally what the text is saying and all we're doing is just repeating what God has already said, right? And so it's uh, it was an amazing week last week. So with that being said, shout out to um, Angela, Marcus, and Brenton. I appreciate you guys and what you all bring to the table each week um, because we, we, we push each other, we, we spur each other on to continue doing um, what God has um, called us to do and then what he has positioned us all together um, to do in this season. So um, great, great, great job. And uh, to you guys, everyone that supports Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday, thank you, thank you, thank you. Again, it's not about us, but it is about um, the truth of God's word being put out, right? Um, and so, um, First Kings chapter 12, y'all. It's going to be really interesting tonight. Demarcus Sanders, what's up, man? Uh, good to see you on tonight. First Kings chapter 12. So if you all remember, um, in chapter 11, we, we got to see uh, the mighty King Solomon um, take his fall, right? B. Haynes, what is up, bro? Um, it, it's really interesting because... You know, when, when people glance at Solomon, and I say, again, glance, they don't take the opportunity to look at Solomon's life, but only from the standpoint of, man, he had great wisdom, he built the temple, he um, did this, did that, whatever, right? Son of David, blase, blase, blah, but you don't take the time to really examine uh, a person's life as we have done in the life of Solomon. You miss so much about the guy, right? And so on last week, we saw um, we saw Solomon's um, reign come to an end, right? Uh, simply because he did not keep the commandments that God laid out for him, and, and it's really beautiful, y'all. Because I said it two weeks ago, and I'll say it again: God never speaks second. And what I mean by that is, is there's never a situation that occurs that God has to look at and then say, well, let me come up with an answer for that. Um, there's nothing that will ever appear, ever arise, that he has to say, well, I've not thought about that before. No, no, no. Everything that we could ever face, ever go through, ever encounter, ever experience, God has an answer for it in his word. He's already said it. He's laid it out. He's wrote it. And it's up to us, it's important for us to make sure that we're reading so that when those situations do arise, we already have God's word to combat um, the situation with, to make the right decision, to um, do what is necessary, to make sure that we're honoring God in whatever the situation is, right? So he never speaks second, always speaks first. And in Solomon's case, he already had it laid out, even back in Deuteronomy chapter 17, um, for what a king was supposed to do. Solomon, however, did not heed 
to what he needed to. He did not heed to the words that God had already put out there, right? And Angela did a great job of breaking down the fact that it was because he had no relationship with him. And so then it leads to his demise in chapter 11. So we're going to pick up in chapter 12, um, dealing with his son, Rehoboam. And at first, when I read this story about Rehoboam, and um, you guys might recognize when we start getting into it, is the fact that I kind of took issue with, Re with Rehoboam. But as we'll see here in a little bit, um, we can't criticize him too much. Although there's some things that we'll be able to look at him and say, probably could have done this or done that differently. However, and some principles to take from it, um, from his short little stint here. But however, a lot of what we're going to see with Rehoboam um, has to do with his daddy. So, all right, let's check this out, y'all. Uh, Miss Taniqua, good to see you. And Monster Beats, Karen Washington, my brother, good to see you. All right, so here it is. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 12, beginning of verse 1, it says, Rehoboam went to Shechem, where all Israel had gathered to make him king. When Jeroboam, son of Nebat, heard of this, he returned from Egypt, for he had fled to, to Egypt to escape from King Solomon. The leaders of Israel summoned him, and Jeroboam spoke with the whole assembly of Israel, uh, and the whole assembly of Israel went to speak with Rehoboam. Your father was a hard master, they said. Lighten the harsh labor demands and heavy taxes that your father imposed on us. Then we will be your loyal subject. Uh, a beautiful mother-in-law. So good to see you all. Um, so check this out, y'all. You guys remember Jeroboam came on the scene in the last chapter, right? And we're going to revisit um, chapter 11 a little later on. But check this out. So Jeroboam and the whole assembly of Israel, they go to Rehoboam, right? And they want to discuss the heavy taxes and the harsh labor that they're having to endure right now, right? And if you remember when Solomon was building the temple, it wasn't just Solomon and, and a small crew of people. No, Solomon had a huge labor force, right, to build the temple and to build um, his palace. Solomon wasn't lifting a finger, right? Solomon was giving the demands and he had people working, right? And so what's interesting about this is Brenton, Brenton hit it on Friday and, I'm, and right here is just another example of it. The children of Israel are under these heavy taxes and this, um, and this harsh labor that the king imposed on them. Now I want you guys to think about that in a second, for a second. The fact that um, the king imposed this upon them. Now, God was very clear back in Deuteronomy, and we're going to go there in just a second, about what would happen when the people chose a king over him. God was very descriptive. God was very clear, right? And so we, we cannot get away from the fact, ladies and gentlemen, that you have to be very conscious in the decisions that you make. Big, small, um, you may not think it means anything, but later on down the road, it's going to mean something to somebody and it's going to affect them some type of way. All right. So now here they are and they've got these heavy taxes on them. They've got all this labor stuff going on. So let's go back to Deuteronomy chapter 18. Let's go back to Deuteronomy chapter 18 because again, God never speaks after a situation has occurred ever. And the sooner that we realize and understand that he really does know everything, that he really does understand what's going on, and he really does have a solution for every situation, the better off we'll be. Uh, we'll find ourselves not getting into so much trouble and all this other stuff that we oftentimes um, find ourselves getting into. So I said Deuteronomy. I meant 1 Samuel chapter 8. All right, here we are. First Samuel chapter eight. And let's start at verse 11 and we'll just read through this real quick. So it says, um, this is how a king will reign over you, Samuel said. The king will draft your sons and assign them to his chariots and his charioteers, making them run before his chariots. Some will be generals and captains in his army. Some will be forced to plow in his fields and harvest his crops. And some will make his weapons and chariot equipment. 
The king will take your daughters from you and force them to cook and bake and make perfumes for him. He will take away the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his own officials. He will take a tenth of your grain and your grape harvest and distribute it among his officials, his officers and, his, and attendants. He will take your male and female slaves and demand the finest of your cattle and donkeys for his own use. He will demand a tenth of your flocks and you will be his slaves. When that day comes, you will beg for relief from this king you are demanding. But then the Lord will not help you. Check this out, y'all. At the time, again, this is a few hundred years ago, right? When Israel's asking for a king, they just want to be like the other nations. And that's literally their reason for asking for the king. Every other nation has a king. God let us have a king. And I want to be clear about this, ladies and gentlemen, that when they came out of Egypt, God blessed them with everything that they needed. He gave them the land. He gave them everything they needed to thrive in the land. He was on top of it, right? He was providing for them. There was nothing that they had need of. But for some reason, they see these other nations and they say, man, they got a king. We want a king. But if you, if you compare apples to apples... The other nations didn't have it as good as the children of Israel did. But see, that's the problem with us. We, all, we oftentimes overlook what God is doing in our life, and we look at somebody else's life and say, man, I, I really wish I had what they had. Man, it really looks good over there. God, why can't you give me what they have over there? Right? When all the while, when you're asking for that to happen, you don't really know what all's coming with that. So here Israel is. They've asked for a king, and God tells them, this is what's about to happen to you guys. You guys keep asking for a king. This is how the king is going to rule over you. And so it didn't really pop up a whole lot with Saul. Saul drafted a couple people into the army and things like that. And that's the thing. It's amazing because God will not always give you the specific details, but he'll give you enough information to make an informed decision. He doesn't have to give you A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, right? He can just tell you, well, if you do A, Z is going to happen, right? He doesn't have to fill in all the blanks. But what he does give you, use that to make an informed decision, right? So what we're seeing here in the first few verses of 1 Kings chapter 12 is just the simple fact that a decision was made way back then that we want a king and now we're complaining because Solomon put all these taxes and all these burdens on us. We need relief, right? So let's go, let's go get the whole community together. And now let's go talk to, to King Rehoboam, right? And see if we can't get some of this stuff taken off of us. No, 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 no. You have to understand this is what you asked for. You may not have asked for it directly, but your ancestors did, right? And that's how those decisions that are made before you come on the scene, that's how they affect everybody else that comes after you. So again, ladies and gentlemen, make sure that the, the decisions you are making in this life at this moment, make sure that they are honoring God. Make sure it is in keeping with what he has commanded you to do, right? Because if not, you don't know how that's going to affect your children later on. You don't know what it's going to do to them. You don't know how it's going to jack your family up or whatever. And so um, that's the first point I wanted to make with this, uh, with this interesting situation here. So, all right, let's jump down to verse five. It says, Rehoboam replied, give me three days to think this over, then come back for my answer. So the people went away. Then King Rehoboam discussed the matter with the older men who had counseled his father Solomon. What is your advice, he asked. How should I answer these people? The older counselors replied, if you are willing to be a servant to these people today, and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your loyal subjects. Now, this is about to get interesting. Check it out. It says, but Rehoboam rejected the advice of the older men and instead asked the opinion of the young men who had grown up with him and were now his advisors. What is your advice? He asked them. How should I answer these people who want me to lighten the burdens imposed by my father? The young men replied, this is what you should tell those complainers who want a lighter burden. 
My little finger is thicker than my father's waist. Yes, my father laid heavy burdens on you, but I'm going to make them even heavier. My father beat you with whips, but I will beat you with scorpions. So, um, Rehoboam, new to the kingdom, right? Goes and talks to these old advisors. And he asks them what he should do. They tell him, right? Hey, man, give him a favorable answer. And then they'll always be loyal to you, right? These guys can't say that. At, they can't give this advice to him as though they've never seen what giving a favorable answer to the people does, right? These guys were not advisors for no reason, right? They weren't just there by happenstance. They weren't just there uh, because Solomon saw him walking along the street and said, hey, you're going to be my advisor. No, these guys gave sound advice, right? But to Rehoboam, it doesn't sound good, right? No, 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 I don't really want to I don't really want to go with your advice. And what's interesting to me is I think it's important because there's a lot that we don't know, right? I've made the conscious decision to be around people who know more than I do. People who have been in this journey of life longer than I have, people who have um, been in the, in the journey of faith longer than I have, and not just, not just claiming to be in the faith, but I'm talking about people who actually walk the walk, right? Not people who make um, good speeches on Monday, on Sundays and Wednesdays and any other Bible conference say, no, 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 I'm talking about people who really, really live the life, right? I've made the conscious decision to be around them. And there are often times when I find myself in a situation, um, I have that circle of people around me to give counsel. Check it out though. The counsel that they give me is not just mere opinion. It's not just mere opinion. We will go back. Let's talk about what God said, right? What did he, what does he have to say about this? And then we go from there. And so it's really interesting because I would encourage each and every person that sees this to make sure you're around people who've been in the game longer than you, people who've been doing this longer than you so that you can learn from them, right? Uh, whether it be a mentor, close friend, whatever, make that connection because there's a lot that you don't know. There's a lot you don't understand. And that's why it's important. Paul encouraged um, Timothy and them in the New Testament, right? Hey, I need the older men teaching the younger men. I need the older women teaching the younger women. Why was that important? Why did Paul have to emphasize that? It was because the younger generation, there was a lot that they did not know. And Paul needed to make sure that Timothy was putting in place the fact that the older elders who have been there, the older women who have been there, all of them to make sure they were doing their part and passing along the right information to the younger generation. Why? So that the younger generation could make really good informed decisions as it pertained to their life in Christ. If you go to Psalm 78, Asaph encourages the people, right? Uh, Psalm 78 and around verse six, and I'm paraphrasing, and he says, um, the whole purpose, we will not hide these truths from, from the next generation. Why? Why are we not hiding the truth from them? So that they would learn to fear the Lord and put their trust in him. See, there's a purpose around, a purpose behind being around people who have been in the game longer than you, people who have experienced things that you may not have experienced so that you can learn and make good decisions, right? But Rehoboam, Rehoboam doesn't want that, right? Rehoboam wants to hear what his boys have to say. And um, let's see here. Boom, verse eight. Rejected the advice of the older men. Instead, asked the opinion. Advice, right? The, the older counselors gave advice. The young men gave their opinions. Typically, when, you, when you're in school, and you know you you're wanting to get your your classes changed or something you're trying to lay out like a degree plan or whatever you go and see what is called an advisor you go see the advisor because the advisor has knowledge on the particular subject that you're trying to handle right which is you're trying to lay out a degree plan right you're trying to figure out hey what what classes do I need to take to accomplish certain major or whatever right 
So you go see what is called an advisor because they have certifications, they have experience, they have the head knowledge, they have all of the things necessary to advise you in the right direction for your um, for your college career path, right? However, on the outside of the advisor's office, what you'll have is, is you'll have a lot of people, whether it be your family, whether it be close friends, whether it be whoever saying, man, I really think you should do this. I, you know, I, I've seen that this makes a lot of money. I've seen this does this, this does that. Here's my opinion. Let me give you my opinion on what I think you should do. Not that I have any knowledge whatsoever about how to get there. I'm just giving you my opinion, right? And this is what you need to do. And oftentimes what we will do, ladies and gentlemen, is we will reject sound advice for an opinion because the opinion matches with what we want to do. The opinion sounds a lot better because it matches with what we're already kind of feeling, right? Although sound advice is good, ah, that opinion sounds better because it's really what I want to do, right? And so check it out, ladies and gentlemen. If everybody in your circle says the same thing as you about everything, you need a new circle. If all your circle of friends do is agree with every idea that you come up with, every every plan that you get ready to throw out there, and they say, yeah, that's good, and they co-sign on everything that you say, there's never a moment when they're, when they're questioning what you're doing. They're not saying, hey, man, have you, have you stopped to think about this? Have you thought about how this is going to affect this, how this is going to affect that? Have you... Um, have you even consulted God for what you're getting ready to do? Have you done any of that? No, 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 I haven't done any of that. And all they're doing is say, yeah, man, that's a good idea. And they're, they're co-signing and everything's cool, right? That makes you feel good. It makes you feel as though you're the smartest one in the group. However, if that's all that they do, they are not your friends. Not your friends at all. See, because real friends are going to give you advice based on the truth of scripture, not mere opinions. And again, that, uh, like I said a minute ago, I'm very fortunate to have a circle of people who that, that's the foundation we work off of right there. Matter of fact, I was talking to one of them the other day. I said, man, I really want to respond this way to this situation. I really want to say this. It doesn't give me an opinion. It doesn't do any of that. We go back to scripture. Okay, well, what does scripture say about how you should respond? And again, it's not opinion, it's advice based on the truth of God's word. And so Rehoboam, he wasn't, he wasn't really hearing that, right? He didn't want the sound advice. He wanted to hear what his boys had to say to him. And again, what's interesting about these guys' opinion is that just by looking, just by looking at the text, right? Because verse 10 says that they call these people who are complaining about these tax burdens and all this stuff, they call them complainers. Right? They call them complainers. They say, man, the, the, all they're doing is complaining to you about this. So you need to make the, make the burdens heavier on them. Just by observing that alone tells me that these, that these boys of Rehoboam's, they've never experienced what these people have experienced. They've never been through the work that these people have to do. Right? They, they've not had to feel the heavy tax burden, the forced labor. They've not had to feel any of that. So they, they sit from, from their high position with Rehoboam and say, man, these guys are just complaining to you because they don't want to work. They're lazy, right? And it's really interesting because when you've never went through anything, when you've never experienced um, what somebody else has experienced, you have no right to say anything about who they are and or what they're doing. Unless you can identify with that person, you have no right to open your mouth and say, man, they're just complaining. Man, they're just doing that. Man, they're just doing that, right? Because you don't know why people are doing what they're doing. You don't understand why somebody may be saying what they're saying. And it's really crazy because, in the, it, again, it just shows even as big as the kingdom was, Solomon, there was no relationship between Solomon and his people. Solomon had hired hands, Right? Solomon was about Solomon's agenda, okay? And so that's it. However Solomon needed to get the palace built, however Solomon needed to get the temple built, um, however he needed to plow the fields, whatever, 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 that's what I need to do, right? I'm not interested in any type of relationships, okay? And y'all, it, it's, very, it, it's very important for us to make sure 
that we're making new relationships with people, right? Because if we're going to help anybody, if we're going to lead anybody to the truth, there has to be relationships there. Now, I'm not saying BFFs, all that stuff. You got to go to coffee every morning and all that. You got to go out to lunch every day. And I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about genuine relationships, right? You are interested in the, in the care of the other person, right? You're interested in making sure that they know who Jesus Christ is. You're interested in helping them get along better in this life, right? And so then if you're in a relationship with somebody and then you see somebody say something as though these people are saying, right, expressing their concerns, their frustrations or whatever, you won't look from a high position and say, man, you guys just stop complaining. You know what I'm saying? You guys don't want to work. You're lazy, this, that, and the third. No, now that you're in relationship with that person, you can look back and over their life and say, oh, okay, it makes sense. I see now why you feel like this is this way or this is that way. And then you're able to work through whatever that situation is together with that person, right? So it's really interesting to me to see um, how Rehoboam's boys spoke about, um, about these people whom they've never done life with and they've never experienced anything with. But you say, I would rather have an informed it, advice from per someone who knows the path that I should take, for sure. And then B, you said experience tested, is experience trusted 100% of the time, man. 100% of the time. So let's keep moving. We got a, we got a few more things to talk about. Uh, verse 14, it says, or verse 12, it says, three days later, Jeroboam and all the people returned to hear Rehoboam's decision, just as the king had ordered. But Rehoboam spoke harshly to the people, for he rejected the advice of the older counselors and followed the advice of his younger advisors. He told the people, my father laid heavy burdens on you, but I'm going to make them even heavier. My father beat you with whips, but I will beat you with scorpions. And even, even Rehoboam's decision um, and what he has to say to these people, it really just shows, kind of speaks to Solomon's leadership as well. You know, um, the fact that he says that my father beat you with whips. What do you say? My father laid heavy burdens on you and my father beat you with whips, right? Again, Solomon was about Solomon's business. It wasn't about the people. And God warned the people. He told them, like I read in 1 Samuel chapter 8, this is what the king's finna do to y'all. But y'all don't, y'all don't want me. Y'all want a king. Y'all want something physical to be in front of you um, versus the God who led you out of slavery that you had been in for all these years, right? the one who provided for you in the wilderness, the one that uh, made water come out of a rock, the one that split the Red Sea open for you, all of this stuff, and yet you want a king. And so now, these is, this is just the result of a decision that you made. So check it out. Uh, verse 15, it says, So the king paid no attention to the people. This turn of events was the will of the Lord, for it fulfilled the Lord's message to Jeroboam, son of Nebat, through the prophet Ahijah from Shiloh. So let's talk about God's plan for a second, all right? Uh, because a lot of, sometimes people struggle with this. And the simplest way for me to, the simplest way for me to define this in dealing with God's sovereignty is this. This is his world, his rules, we're, we're just a part of we're just a part of his plan, right? We can choose to be a part of his plan or not to be a part of his plan. Whatever, um, you have free will to make your own decisions, but understand this: that his plan will still go forward, whether you agree with it or not. So he does what he wants to do, regardless of how we may feel about it, right? Because again, it's all about what he's trying to get accomplished, right? What he's trying to do, and so a lot of people struggle with that. A lot of people struggle with the fact that. God can do what he wants to, whenever he wants to, however he wants to, through whoever he wants to. Well, we have to understand this. He's the creator. We're the creation, right? Everything in the world is subject to who he is. We didn't ask for it to be this way, but it is that way. And to be honest, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with being the creation and allowing him to be the creator, right? And so um, this whole event with Rehoboam, that's why I said we can, 
you can't criticize them too heavily. But I mean, there's still principles we can take from that we took from his whole um, negotiations with his counselors. Uh, the fact is that it was all God's plan, right? Because God had already issued a decree in the last chapter when he was talking to Jeroboam, right? And so it set into motion this plan to take away the kingdom from Solomon's son, which is exactly what he told Solomon would happen if Solomon disobeyed him, right? So Rehoboam's decision didn't really alter anything that God was trying to do, right? It just continued to press the agenda forward. And so let's jump down to verse 16. It says, actually, I had another verse I wanted to read. Uh, let's go to Isaiah chapter 55. That's where I wanted to go. And then I want to look at two things in Proverbs and then we'll keep it moving. So Isaiah chapter 55, because again, we never want to make anything up. We just want to let, we want to let God's word speak because now we're getting ready to deal with Jeroboam. So let's check this out. It says, verse 10, it says, the rain and snow come down from the heavens and stay on the ground to water the earth. They cause the grain to grow producing seed for the farmer and bread for the hungry. It is the same with my word. I send it out and it always produces fruit. It will accomplish all I want it to and it will prosper everywhere I send it. So it doesn't matter what the people may have thought about Rehoboam's decision. Again, this is because this situation happened because God already spoke it, right? This is his will being accomplished. And so even in Proverbs, it says in chapter 16, it says that we may make our plans, but God determines our steps. You can plan as much as you want to. You can uh, lay things out all that you want to, whatever, whatever, whatever. But at the end of the day, it's all about his plan. So don't get, that's why it's very important for us to make sure that we consult him in everything that we do. So when you have an understanding that he's ultimately in control, you don't want to plan without him. You don't want to make decisions without him. You want to make sure that whatever it is that you're coming up with in your head, that you're bringing it to him, right? And so um, I thought that, that was that was really interesting because somebody, Mr. King, I mean, yeah, Mr. Jeroboam here, he is going to forget who is actually in charge. We'll see this in just a second. So check it out. Let's go to verse, uh, verses 16 through 20, deal with um, just the people reacting to Rehoboam's advice. And basically they say um, in the latter part of verse 16, when they realized that Rehoboam did not want to um, lighten the load on them, they say, down with the dynasty of David, we have no interest in the son of Jesse. Back to your homes, O Israel. Look out for your own house, O David. So the people of Israel returned home, but Rehoboam continued to rule over the towns, over the Israelites who lived in the towns of Judah, which again is exactly what God said was going to happen. And so um, King sends one of the guys who was over forced labor, his name is Adoniram, sends him down to um, try to restore order, right? Because now everything's breaking up. Right, the kingdom starting to divide. the The northern and the southern tribes are starting to split, and Rehoboam is losing control of the people. Right, so they send Adoniram down here to go handle up on everything, but um, he ends up getting stoned. Right, the people end up killing Adoniram um, because of the king's decision. Right, and so you just continue to see more and more and more how important it was that the king was to follow what God was commanding. Because if you go back uh, either last Tuesday or the Tuesday before when Angela was speaking, the fact that God made it clear that all Israel would be uprooted from the land, right? If the king messed up and we're not there yet, but we'll, we will get there, right? And so it just goes to show the fact that the king had um, high accountability, high responsibility over the people. And so when he messed up the people, they were also gonna be um, affected by those decisions as well. And so now um, 
the people of Israel not happy with Rehoboam. They kill uh, the dude over forced labor, Adoniram. And so now Jer uh, Rehoboam, he jumps in his chariot and he fled to Jerusalem. And it says, verse 19, And to this day the northern tribes of Israel have refused to be ruled by a descendant of David. When the people of Israel learned of Jeroboam's return from Egypt, they called an assembly and made him king over all Israel. So only the tribe of Judah remained loyal to the family of David. So now, um, here they are, right? They're making Jeroboam king, which is exactly what God told Jeroboam would happen in um, chapter 11. At the end of chapter 11, he told Jeroboam, hey, this is what I'm going to do for you. So let's check it out. Uh, verse 21, it says, When Rehoboam arrived at Jerusalem, he mobilized the men of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin, 180,000 select troops to fight against the men of Israel and to restore the kingdom to himself. So now he's getting ready to go back. He's handling up, right? Now I'm going to go. I'm going to um, get the kingdom back together. Got 180,000 people. We will restore order. No. Anytime, again, we just read it in Isaiah, right? God said that his word will not return back to him void. It will not return until it has accomplished the purpose, the purpose for which he sent it. And this purpose right here is, I'm tearing the kingdom away from your son, Solomon. I'm not taking it away from you. I'm taking it away from your son. So it doesn't matter what your son tries to do, right? He's not stronger than I am. He's not mightier than I am. There's nothing he can do. Right, I'm going to do exactly what I said I was going to do, and it's really it's really interesting because sometimes we think that we're smarter than God. We think we we honestly think that we are we we have more power than Him, right? We think that we can really alter plans that God has already put in place. And I'm going to touch this, and I'm going to get off, and then we'll we'll keep moving through the chapter. But I'm going to throw this out there, just the simple fact of. We think that we can maintain our own salvation, right? Bible makes it clear that we are kept in his hand, right? Jesus makes it clear, John chapter 10, that no one can snatch us from his hand. But then he says, he gives us to the father and his father is greater than he is. And no one can snatch us out of the father's hand. But yet for some reason, we think that we have enough power that we can make any decision and it's going to cancel the power in which God keeps us. Okay, all right. So anyway, that's just one example of us thinking that we are more powerful or that we're even smarter than God, right? Thinking that we actually have the power to mess up what he's already done. So uh, Rehoboam, here he goes, right? He's going to, to restore order to the kingdom. But it, check it out. Shemaiah's prophecy, it says, But God said to Shemaiah, the man of God say to Rehoboam, son of Solomon, king of Judah, and to all the people of Judah and Benjamin and to the rest of the people, this is what the Lord says. Do not fight against your relatives, the Israelites. Go back home for what has happened is my doing. So they obeyed the message of the Lord and went home. This is, this is interesting to me because Rehoboam does something that his daddy didn't do. He listened. He listened, right? God was very clear when he spoke to Solomon about what would happen, right? Solomon didn't listen, but here it is. Rehoboam's getting ready to go restore the kingdom. And now when God says, hey, you guys just pack up, go on back to the house. Don't fight against your relatives because what's going on right now, the whole divide of the kingdom, this is my doing, right? And so Light comes on a Rehoboam said, and he says, all right, y'all, let's pack up. Let's go back to the house. And it says, so they obeyed and they went home. Uh, they obeyed the message of the Lord and went home as the Lord commanded. So uh, I thought that that was really interesting just to see the difference between Solomon and his son, right? Um, again, Solomon wasn't all bad, but however, the decisions he did make, um, they, weren't, they weren't favorable for him and now not favorable for his son. And so uh, what's interesting to me is this, is that it's important to make sure that we're doing the last thing that God has told us to do, right? Whatever it is, because again, Rehoboam's not responsible for the split of the kingdom. He's not. Rehoboam's responsible for this moment right here. And that is not going to fight against the Israelites because had, Re had Rehoboam 
went to fight against the Israelites and disobeyed the word of the Lord, we probably wouldn't read about Rehoboam anymore. He probably would have died in the process. Okay, so what you're responsible for doing is what God has told you to do. Absolutely nothing else. And, I, and I'm, and I'm going to say this, that if your obedience causes people or things, opportunities, whatever, to be removed from your life, if your obedience to God causes that to happen, three words, let it happen. Let it happen. In this instance, Rehoboam is sitting back and watching the kingdom that was given to him from his father, was passed down from his father. He is watching the kingdom be torn apart. He is watching all of the forced labor, the people who build, the people who plow, the people who tend to the vineyards. He's watching all of these people leave, right? Yet God speaks to him and he says, go home. This is my doing. Rehoboam has a choice. Do I obey what God has said or do I continue to try to make and restore order on my own? Right? Because again, had he fought against what the word of God, he would have lost. Why? Because exactly what Isaiah 55 says, his word does not return void at all. Maturity, 100%, man. And so whatever that looks like in your life, right? If you find yourself even now in a situation with somebody, whatever, whatever, a job, opportunities, and God says don't, he says, just go back home, just like he told these guys, right? Do something different other than what you're planning to do. Listen to what he's saying, because it will work out for you in the long run. You may not see it right now. You may not understand why things happen to hap have to happen the way that they are, right? You may not understand why this friendship has to be gone or why you didn't get that opportunity, why you didn't get that promotion, right? Why, why did you not get to experience this? Why does it seem like things are breaking off in your life? Why does it seem like things are going really wrong in your life? Understand that if you're doing what God is telling you to do and that happens, it's out of your control. That's his doing. Let him do what he wants to do and trust him as your father. Don't try to get involved because then you're only going to end up hurting yourself even more. Right. And so I, I thought that that was that was really good because for Rehoboam to be as young as he is, just sitting back and watching the whole kingdom fold right before his eyes. But again, it, it had to do with the decision that his daddy made, not a decision that he made. He's only responsible for his obedience now, right? This is the first time God speaks to Rehoboam that, I've seen, that we've seen here. First time God speaks to Rehoboam, right? But it only took the one time for Rehoboam to say, okay, you know what? I will. I'll go back home. I, I don't want anything. I don't want to... I don't want to get in the middle of this. I want to read you read, read you guys a scripture from uh, from Proverbs, and it really it really blessed me and it really encouraged me. Because we're talking about this whole this whole aspect of of obedience, and let's go to chapter sixteen, verse six. It says, "Unfailing love and faithfulness." Make atonement for sin. But this is the part I love. Check it out. By fearing the Lord, people avoid evil. When you understand who God is, when you understand what he's, what he's telling you to do, when you, when you understand the difference between obedience and disobedience, when you fear him enough to understand that if you fight against his plans, he could really wreck your life. It keeps you from making that disobedient decision. It keeps you from making a decision that goes against his word, making a decision that is not in line with who he's called you to be. You fear him enough and you say, you know what, now nah, nah, I'm going to listen. I, I don't want to do that. Right. I shared with one of the brothers the other day, just just the fact that as we've been walking through this scripture, the way that we have it is it is continuing to increase a, a very healthy dose of fear in my life. And I don't mind saying that. I don't mind saying that I'm scared of who he is because I am. Um, because there's, you know, things can get really bad really quick when we when we're not walking where we need to walk with him. And there's so much that we don't understand that he has kept us from. 
because of the decisions we've made. I look around and this is no shot at anybody and I'm not, I'm not looking down on anyone. But what I will say is you can look around, look at your life, look at the decisions you've made and look at the decisions maybe some other people have made who may have had the same opportunities of you, but they didn't take the same path that you did and just look at the comparison of where you are compared to where they are. And again, it's not a slight against anybody. It's just the simple fact that because we've made the decision to be obedient to God, that there is so much that God has kept us from. And I fear him and I respect him for that because I understand and I understand this very, very clearly that number one, I, he didn't have to allow me to live here. He didn't have, he didn't have to allow me to make it out of that car accident back in August. He didn't have to, right? I understand the God that can stop a car from, from crushing me completely. He's the same God that if I decide to be disobedient, he can allow things to get way worse in my life. And so again, I love seeing this example here with Rehoboam, the fact that all it took was one time for God to speak to him and say, hey man, this is my doing, leave me alone. You know what I'm saying? Let me handle this, right? And so Rehoboam goes back, goes back to his house. And you know, it's it, it, it reminds me of just like um, so, uh, some old movies, some old TV show I saw, you know, there's always this, um, this big dog or whatever, he's chewing on a bone or he's, He's eating his food or whatever. And nobody wants to go over there and mess with that dog while he's eating, right? Nobody wants to go over there and mess with him because he's protecting what's in front of him, right? And so then um, it, it can bring about some some real crazy consequences if you if you try to mess with that dog while he's trying to eat. So anyway, um, again, great example to see there from Ray Baum. Angela, what's going on? Good to see you. All right, so let's keep it moving, you guys. Verse 25, and so Jeroboam, this guy's a trip. Um, he said, it says, Jeroboam then built up the city of Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim, and it became his capital. Later he went and built up the town of Peniel. Jeroboam thought to himself, this is going to be the first thing that's wrong with this situation. Jeroboam thought to himself, unless I am careful, the kingdom will return to the dynasty of David. When these people go to Jerusalem to offer sacrifices at the temple of the Lord, they will again give their allegiance to King Rehoboam of Judah. They will kill me and make him their king instead. Let's go back to Let's go back to chapter chapter 11. Verse 29. Actually, we won't read 29. Let's jump down to 31 because here's the here's the problem with us. Is that when God, when what God has said to us doesn't line up with our thought process, then we think that we have to help him out. And that's what's so crazy is that the fact that it's his plan. So it has to, for it to be his plan, it has to be his thought process. His plan does not have to look like how you think it needs to look. Never, never in scripture have we seen God say, hey, I've got this plan. Let me run it by you and see what you have to think about it. Let me work this out and then you co-sign on it and tell me if this is the way you want it to look. Do I need to make, do I need to increase this a little more? Do I need to decrease this a little more? Um, this is my thought. You just tell me what you want, right? And I'll match what you think because I'm God and you're human and that's the way things are supposed to be. No, if you go back to Isaiah chapter 55, go back three verses to, um, to verse eight and verse nine and I'll paraphrase. He simply says, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts, right? As the heavens are above the earth, so my thoughts are, and so my ways are above yours, right? So his plans have absolutely nothing to do with how you think they need to look. But for some reason, when, we, when they don't match up, we think, man, I need to get involved. I got I got to do something. I got to help God out because apparently he doesn't know how he needs to handle this situation for me because it's not looking the way that I need that I think it needs to look. No, let your faith push past your logic, right? Faith is in what you cannot see, not what you can see. So he doesn't have to make it to where your natural eye can say, oh yeah, God, that's it. That's the one. Now I got you. Now I got you. Now I trust you. I'm really, really trusting you now because you're making it look like how I need it to look. No. He's asking you to have faith. Check it out, though. Jeroboam thought to himself, there's your problem, brother. Thought to yourself, 
Let's go back to um, 11, verse 31. It says, Then he said to Jeroboam, Take ten pieces, uh, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I'm about to tear the kingdom from the hand of Solomon, but I will give ten of the tribes to you. There's the first time he says it, right? So then he says, uh, let's go down to verse 35. But I will take the kingdom away from his son and give 10 of the tribes to you. His son will have one tribe so that the descendants of David, my servant, will continue to reign shining like a lamp in the city. I have chosen to be the place for my name. Verse 37 says, here it is. And I will place you on the throne of Israel and you will rule over all that your heart desires. Three different times he tells Jeroboam he's going to establish him. So why now does Jeroboam think in his mind that he has to do anything to help God accomplish this? But yet, ladies and gentlemen, it's the same picture with us, right? We think that we have to help God out. If you go back to Abraham, right? When God gave the promise to Abraham, he said, hey, your wife, she's going to give birth to a seed. I'm going to use the seed to make your father of many nations. All of this, right? Abraham, the promise does not line up with the way that Abraham thinks it should. So now he listens to his wife. She says, hey, sleep with Hagar, my handmaid. This way we'll make the promise come about. Nope, that ain't what God told you to do. God told you that he was going to make it happen. He needed you to trust him, right? Nope. Not you thinking on your own, not you coming up with your own plan, your own scheme of trying to help God out. He does not need your help. So sit still, sit down, take a seat, watch him work. Tells Jeroboam three different times, I'm going to give the, the 10 tribes to you. I'm going to place you on the throne of Israel. But that's not enough for you, Jeroboam, right? Same thing for us. We feel like we need so much more from God. Why? Why? Why is it that it takes so much, we, we expect so much effort out of God to speak to us, right? He has to do, he has to jump through 18 different hoops. He has to rain down fire from heaven. At the same time, he has to bring water up from the ground to meet the fire so that it doesn't burn our house down. And then he has to, he has to make all of this stuff happen just so we'll trust him. But we can let some, somebody just walk up off the street and say, hey, I think you should be doing this. And then boom will take their opinion over what the creator has said. Really interesting to me. And so Jeroboam thinks he needs to help God out. And I encourage you guys to go back and read um, chapter 11, 29, all the way down through 40, um, because it, it's going to give great, great, great backstory to what we're about to see here with Jeroboam. So check it out. Uh, verse 28. Verse 28 says, so on the advice of his counselors, on the advice of his counselors, let's see. The king made two gold calves. He said to the people, it is too much trouble for you to worship in Jerusalem. Look, these are the gods who brought you out of Egypt. These are the gods that brought you out of Egypt, right? So now Jeroboam is scared that when they go back to worship in Jerusalem, that they're going to give their allegiance back to Rehoboam, right? So you know what? I got it. I'll fix it. The only way that, that I'm going to be able to keep the kingdom is if I keep the people here, right? If I put in the effort to do this. No, God told you back in chapter 11 that I was going to do this. I was going to give you the 10 tribes of Israel. I was going to give you everything that your heart desired. But to see, there was, a, there, was a, there was a conditional statement after that. And basically, God told him that if you do what I tell you to do, if you're obedient to me, right, then you can have all of this. But see, that's, that's the problem. We get so caught up in the promise God makes that we skip over the conditions in which he makes the promise. And then when things go wrong in our lives, we say, well, man, God, why, why didn't this happen? Why isn't this working? Why isn't this plan not succeeding? Well, you forgot to re read the fine print. There was, a, there was a portion that you had to contribute to this, right? And so Jeroboam is, is jacking all of this stuff up. So um, 
it, it's really interesting because the very thing that God was tearing the kingdom away from Solomon for, which was Solomon's heart being turned away from him and Solomon making all these shrines, making all these places for um, idol worship and all of this stuff was the very thing that Jeroboam initiates. The very thing that Jeroboam initiates. And it's really crazy because now what we're starting to see is counterfeit and compromise. Like I posted Friday or Saturday, true worship is costly. Idolatry is convenient. See, and we understand worship is not just going to church on Sundays and singing a bunch of beautiful songs and good lyrics, um, all of that, right? No, no, no. Worship is a lifestyle. Worship is what we do every day, right? Romans 12 and 1, 12, 1 and 2. He says, therefore, brothers and sisters, I urge you in, the mer in full view of the mercies of God to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, Right? Now we're starting to see counterfeit and compromise. See, because, and this, this is what's really crazy, is that these idol gods, the people could come to them any type of way they wanted to. Any, there, there was no standard in worshiping these gods, right? Because worshiping these idol gods appealed to their flesh. See, because a lot of these idol, idol worship gods... They, they indulged in sexual immorality, child sacrifices, all of this detestable stuff, right? And so in order for them to worship the idol gods, there was no, there was no accountability. There was no standard. There was, no, there was nothing that they had to do, right, to change their lifestyle. But true worship for us calls us to change our lifestyle, it doesn't cause us it doesn't call for us to live and to bring things to God any type of way that we can just sacrifice this to God and say oh you know what this is good enough right we can't just you cannot show up to the God of the universe in your flesh and think here God be pleased with what I'm giving you today this is my flesh right be be pleased you know my heart you know my heart you know you know you know and that's what we do we tell God God you know you know yeah I'm not really feeling it today no 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 True worship is sacrificial. So I have to ask the question, how is your worship life? What does that look like? Are you just bringing God anything? Are you just giving him whatever? Saying, you know what? It doesn't call me to change anything. It doesn't call me to do anything different. I can just do whatever I want to do. Right? Hear God, be pleased. No, sir. No, ma'am. We have to, true worship calls us to change our lifestyle. Cannot be in the presence of the God of the universe. Cannot be in relationship with him and your life still be a hot mess. If it is, it's not that there has not been proper investment on his part because he gave us everything we need to have the right relationship. It is lack of investment on your part. And so now Jeroboam is initiating this, right? He's telling the people, look, here, here's the calves. Here's the gods that brought you out of Egypt. And Aaron did the same thing back in Exodus chapter 32. He showed him, look, here are your gods. This, this is what brought you out of Egypt. And so he led the people into sin. And so now Jeroboam is leading the people into sin. And so now instead of the people traveling to Jerusalem, because again, and for them, that was a sacrifice for them to travel back to Jerusalem from their from their respective tribes, right? Now, here's, here's what compromise does. Here's what counterfeit does, right? He set these calves up at the boundaries of Dan and Bethel, right? At the edge of his kingdom, his respective kingdom. So the people didn't have to travel that far. Hey, guys, it's too far. It's too much. Don't, you ain't got to go all the way to Jerusalem. Just stay right here with me, right? Worship the gods right here, right? We, you, you can still make the sacrifices, you can still you can still do the rituals and all this stuff. See, working at a bank, I worked at a bank as a teller. And they train us. They train us on how to recognize counterfeit money from from real money, right? Um we have to go through, you know, these different courses and all that stuff and and but they gave us this pen, right? 
And uh, you, you guys have seen it. If you've been if you've been shopping at all, you give somebody a you know a fresh crispy twenty, or you give them a fresh fifty, hundred dollar bill, whatever. They're going to either hold it up to the light and make sure there's a strip in there, or they're going to um, mark it with a pin, right, and make sure that whatever the color stays intact. So we were trained on how to recognize counterfeits. It would seem as though within the body of Christ. We, had, we struggle with recognizing counterfeit from the truth. Because, and again, I'm, I'm not afraid to, to make this statement. The fact that there is so much that goes on under the name of Christ within the body of, of, of the church, we don't recognize it. And we, we say, oh, no, that's, really, that's, that's real. That's the real thing. When all the time it's a counterfeit. And that's, all the, that's the best the enemy can do. The best thing the enemy can do is distract you with the count with counterfeit money, with the counterfeit lifestyle. That's it. See, he can he can he can line it up real good and say, "Look, you ain't gotta go. You, I mean, you ain't you ain't gotta go to church today. You ain't gotta go. You don't have to go there and do that. You don't. You you can have a cheat day. You know what I'm saying? Seven five, six days a week, you've been living right. Just have that cheat day. Go go over there and, and watch this flick. You know what I'm saying? Go over here and." And holler at home, girl. Go holler at homeboy. You know what I'm saying? Relax, relax. You're taking it. You're taking this. You're taking this. This this walk with Jesus Christ. You're taking it too serious. It's too much for you, right? And we allow that to play in our heads, and then that leads us to sinful behavior, which is exactly what Jeroboam has initiated here. That's why it has to be relationship over rituals. It has to be relationship over rituals. See, because had, and this is, this is why the, the children of Israel's lives are so jacked up because check it out. Um, and then we'll, then we'll get out of here. Um, they never entered into a real relationship with God. I can prove that in Exodus chapter 20. So let's go to Exodus 20 real quick. They never entered into a real relationship with him. It was always superficial. It was always, it was fake. Um, they never... They never wanted that real relationship. So here it is. Chapter 20, verse 18. It says, when the people heard, and now God had just given them the Ten Commandments. It says, when the people heard the thunder and the loud blast of the ram's horn, and when they saw the flashes of lightning and the smoke billowing from the mountain, they stood at a distance, trembling with fear. And they said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but don't let God speak directly to us or we will will die at that moment they did not want anything to do as far as a relationship with god and, and even the fact that they chose a king over them right they've never they've never entered into this relationship so because they never really entered in the relationship they never really had any type of commitment that they needed to honor right when we're in relationship with god we understand when the counterfeit shows up when the compromise shows up, no, 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 no. I, I've been in a relationship with him for too long. I understand there's a standard, right? There's a commitment that I made to him. And what you're trying to offer me with this counterfeit, with this compromise, it don't line up with what I committed to with him, right? And so e even for married folk, right? When, when, that, when something comes along to entice you, you say, no, 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 no. That's enticing. That looks good. But that's not in line with the commitment that I made to my wife or, or my husband. That's not in line with that. So I can't, I, can't, I can't settle for the compromise. And the compromise may feel good. It may look good. It may, it may satisfy, satisfy all your flesh, whatever. And that's what it's supposed to do, right? Because this life with God, it's not always going to make you feel comfortable. Because he's got to cut some things away from you, right? Because the whole purpose... Of us being in this walk, he is conforming us into the image of his son. So you're not always going to be comfortable. So live in that moment. Live in, in, the, in the moments of being uncomfortable. And know that when you start feeling comfortable, start checking the walk. Start checking the decisions you're making. Start checking how much time you've been spending with him. We should never get comfortable. Ever get comfortable. But always, we should be uncomfortable from him having to shift, from him having to break some things off of us, from him having to cut away. We should be in some pain sometimes because he, he's cutting away that flesh. He's, doing, he's continuing to do a circumcision on, on our heart, right? That's how you know that you're staying close to him. That's how you know you're being conformed into his image and into his likeness. 
So anyway, Jeroboam introduces all this stuff. Remember the commitment that you made. All right, so verse 31, check it out. It says... Jeroboam also erected buildings at the pagan shrines and ordained priests from the common people, those who were not from the priestly tribe of Levi. I say counterfeit worship never works. Doing anything outside of the way God prescribes never works. He made a golden calf, a violation of one of the commandments, right? And now he's ordaining priests who don't belong to the priestly tribe of Levi. That's the second problem, right? You're trying, you're trying to make these things um, work for you. You're trying, you're coming up with all of this stuff because you're trying to hold on to something that you have no control over. Now you're jacking up the promise that God gave to you. Cause God said, if you follow me, if you're obedient to me, then I'll give you all of this stuff. I'll let you have the kingdom. But now, now you're introducing sin to my people, more sin to my people. Nah, nah, you finna lose it too. So, um, verse 32, 33, and we're out of here, you guys. It says, and Jeroboam instituted a religious festival in Bethel, held on the 15th day of the eighth month. This is key, you guys. Listen to this. In imitation of the annual festi festival of shelters in Judah, there at Bethel, he offered sacrifices to the calves he made, and he appointed priests for the pagan shrines he had made. So on the 15th day of the eighth month, and a day that he himself had designated, imitation he designated Jeroboam offered sacrifices on the altar at Bethel. He instituted a religious festival for Israel and he went up to the altar to burn incense. Imitation. That's it. So check it out. If you got, being from the South, we like sweet tea, right? We like, we love sweet tea. And for those that don't love sweet tea, it's cool. It's cool. But I love sweet tea. Now, I've been drinking sweet tea long enough to know that when somebody drops Splenda in my tea, or they're really using sugar in the tea, all right? You, 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 you can spot the difference, you know what I'm saying? You understand, man, oh, wait, it's nah, 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 that's Splenda, see? Now, Splenda at first, Splenda has a really good initial taste to it, right? It tastes really sweet at first, but that aftertaste, though, that aftertaste is what gets you. That's what make that's what makes you think, no, wait a second. No, nah, that ain't that ain't sugar. That ain't the real thing. I've got that imitation sugar in my stuff. And right, and you want to call the waiter waiter, man, give me something else. Give me a Dr. Pepper or something. I can't I can't deal with the imitation because you've tasted the real thing. Ladies and gentlemen, when we entered into this relationship, into this relationship with Jesus Christ, we have tasted the real thing. We have seen the real thing. We have experienced God's presence, the real, the real stuff. We've experienced it. And so when the enemy tries to offer us compromise, when he tries to offer us, um, you know, counterfeits for, for worshiping, for living a lifestyle that's pleasing to God, we should have a bad taste in our mouth and say, you know, no, mm -mm, that ain't right. That, that don't taste right. See, because I've experienced him. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I've been some places with him. I've seen him do some things, right? And because of those experiences, because of my relationship with him, it has led me to a place that I'm not satisfied with. The, and that's the thing, y'all. We're not experiencing him enough because we're satisfied with the imitation. We want the imitation, right? It doesn't cost us anything. But no, nah, y'all, I, I, I've been with him too long now. Y'all can't offer me anything fake. Y'all can't offer me anything fake and expect me to go through it because there's no other God. Like I said earlier, like I said earlier about my car, there's no other God that can do that. I don't care. There's no Buddha. There's no Confucius. There's no um, Allah, whatever. None of your gods can do what mine have done. Bar none. Can't do it. A God that, that kept my wife and I together through the midst of this traumatic experience. I don't want the fake stuff. I want the real thing. I've experienced the real thing. And it, it, is, it is so amazing, you know, and, and no other God has sent their son to die for my sins. Right? Even while I even while I was an enemy to him, he still made the decision to come and love me and to come and love you. So guys, stop settling for 
the fake stuff, these cheap imitations, these, these, so, these self-proclaimed prophets, these word of knowledge folk, all of that stuff. We've experienced the real thing. It's alive. It's a living source. And he's breathed upon it. And all we have to do is just stick with that. That's it. And so we don't need anything else. And so, um, guys, that is that is um, chapter 12 of 1 Kings. Uh, I had a great time studying this. I had a great time looking through this. And so, again, have a good circle around you. Trust when God says something. Don't try to help him out and reject the counterfeits. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we love you today. God, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you that you are the real thing. That there is um, there's none beside you. There's no one greater than you. There's no one who can even get in the same category as you. God, you are, um, you are high and lifted up. And Father, I thank you for just being you. Father, I pray tonight that this word will um, fall on good soil. God, that you um, will have opened up the hearts of your people to receive your word because your word speaks to our heart. It doesn't make sense to our mind all the time, but God, um, it is to pierce our hearts. So God, if even if it doesn't make sense to our mind, that's cool, that's fine. But God, I'm, I'm asking tonight that you allow your word to pierce our hearts, change our lives. And uh, God, we just love you. We thank you. Thank you for this opportunity, God, for brothers and sisters to get on and to hear the truth of your word because this is all about what you have to say to us. It's not about opinions. It's not about uh, denominations, ideologies, different backgrounds. But God, it's simply we want to hear from you. And so, Father, we love you and we thank you for this tonight. Father, I pray that um, you would help our hearts to just be open all week. Um, God, even coming back tomorrow with Angela um, in chapter 13. God, I pray that you would uh, give her the words, God, to speak clearly to us, uh, God, so that we can continue to um, to get the protein that we need, God, to have the fuel that we need to, um, to live this life of obedience to you. And so, Father, we love you. We thank you. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. All right, guys, I love you all. I know it's a little over time tonight. Um, sometimes it happens. Uh, but anyway, love you guys. Appreciate your support. Angela will be on tomorrow. Um, should be on tomorrow evening sometime. So, um, you guys be sure to, to, to come out and support. Um, and again, we don't have to prod you and all that stuff. Um, cause you're not drawn to us. You're drawn to him. So, uh, you guys have a great evening. We will see you guys on the other side of success. I'm out.